Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Havens Wright Center Fall 2022 Lecture Series. My name is Adrian Padgett, and I will be facilitating the event today. Today's talk is, Is There an Alternative? by Roberto Mangabera Unger. We're thrilled to have him join us today for what promises to be an excellent presentation and discussion. But before we introduce Professor Unger, I'd like to go over a few quick logistical matters. First, he will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, after which we'll about have 30 to 35 minutes for discussion. We will try and conclude today by 1.30 p.m. Central Time, just under 90 minutes from now. The meeting today is being recorded and the video will be posted to the Havens Wright Center YouTube channel, as well as to our website in the coming weeks. I'd also like to let you know of some upcoming Havens Wright Center lectures, on Thursday, November 10th at 12 noon US Central Time, 6 p.m. UK time, we will welcome Regina S. Baker for her lecture, Context Mat Matters, Structural Racism and Racial Inequality in the United States. And on Tuesday, November 17th at 12 noon US Central, 6 p.m. UK, we will welcome Kim Moody, who will deliver his talk, Time and Motion, US Labor in the Era of Disease digitization and disruption. For details on those talks, including how to register, you can please visit our website. Now to today's event. To introduce Professor Unger, I'd like to turn it over to Joel Rogers, Noam Chomsky Professor of Law, Public Affairs and Sociology here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as Director of the Havens Wright Center. <clears throat> So thanks a lot, Adrian. And uh, it's it's wonderful to have uh, Roberto here, Roberto Mungabira Unger. Uh, you, I assume you've read his bio blurb uh, and you already know he's the Roscoe Pound Professor of Law at Harvard um, University, uh, where uh, he's also at the JFK School, has an appointment at the JFK School. And I hope you know that along with all of his scholarly work, he's long been, always been politically active, especially in his native Brazil. You know, he was a founding member of the Brazilian Democratic Movement Party uh, under Lula and Dilma, both of them. He served as uh, the Minister of Strategic Affairs. You know, he's, he's very, very involved. And he's written a slew of influential books in political and legal philosophy and practical affairs. He's obsessed, as most of us are, with uh, what we're going to offer the world uh, after the defeat of uh, or effective defeat of social democracy as a way to achieve both liberty and greater equality at the same time. Most recent one of those books is uh, we were just talking to him about it. It's very short. I'm sure it's very lively. It's called Governing the World Without World Government. Um, now, as, as he'll tell anyone who listens, uh, Roberto's uh, uh, roots, intellectual roots, go very, very deep into very classical European social theory, the, the essential claim of which from Vico through Marx and, and beyond was that society is not a frozen artifact or part of the natural world, but something almost and certainly uh, uh, warm and, and certainly plastic, incorrigible, that's made and imagined by human beings. What distinguishes Roberto from a lot of more timid theorists uh, of our time is he takes that insight very seriously. He's resolutely secular, not believing in an afterlife, uh, but very much inspired by the unfathomable wonders and potential beauty of this one. And he's also deeply annoyed, uh, perennially annoyed at our repeated self-diminishment and blindness to that fact. Uh, he doesn't have exalted views of human beings. He thinks they're naturally groundless, unable to see the beginning or end of time and thus the framework of their own existence. He knows them to be insatiable, endlessly curious, that's good, uh, not just materially greedy, uh, but also, and, and happily for us, if not for them, also mortal. So if you're observing humanity and worried ever about its self-destructive ways, maybe you could take some solace that in 100 years we'll have all new people. Anyway, 
Unger cheerfully recommends that those who are currently blessed with the gift of life take it very, very seriously and try to get as much out of it as possible. Try to take as a goal for all uh, deep freedom. Um, by that, he means, you know, defying the illusions of false necessity, obedience to defenseless orthodoxies, or, you know, giving in to, I don't know, the lure of different sorts of escapism in fully exploring and loving this wonderful mystery and, uh, and, and for a personal goal to die only once. Anyway, with that very cheerful rock and roll introduction, I'm delighted to welcome this kindred spirit, this bonimus uh, kindred spirit, um, Roberto. Take it away. Thank you, Joel. So, the world is bent under the burden of a dictatorship of no alternatives. The topic of my talk today is not how we can overthrow this dictatorship, it's what lies on the other side of the dictatorship. Although, of course, the two topics are in some way connected because a source of resistance to any attempt to overthrow the dictatorship of no alternatives is the claim that there is no alternative. Now, I want to begin by describing three points of departure for my argument. The first point of departure has to do with the nature of programmatic argument itself, arguing about alternatives. If I propose to you an alternative that is very far from what exists, you may say, it's interesting, but it's utopian. If I propose something that's close to what exists, you're likely to respond, it's feasible, but it's trivial. Almost anything that can be proposed in the current climate of opinion is likely to be dismissed as either utopian or trivial. This false dilemma, which threatens to paralyze the programmatic imagination, arises from a misunderstanding of the nature of a programmatic argument. A programmatic argument is not about a blueprint. It's about a succession. It's not like architecture, it's like music. And the most important features of any programmatic argument are that it mark a direction and that in a particular historical circumstance, it select the first steps by which to begin to move in that direction. But this false dilemma has been greatly aggravated in our circumstance by intellectual confusion. We lack today a credible way of thinking and talking about structural change and structural alternatives. The last major attempt to formulate a structural view was Karl Marx's theory of society and history, which has become literally incredible. Even those who use its vocabulary no longer believe in the social theoretical assumptions that give sense to this vocabulary. And the result of that absence of a way to think about structural change is to fall back on a bastardized criterion of political realism, which is that a proposal is realistic to the extent that it comes close to what already exists. But this view of political realism is, of course, nothing but a declaration of intellectual bankruptcy. Now, if any programmatic argument worth considering can be explored at points relatively close to what exists or points relatively far from what exists, we can traverse the whole spectrum from the proximate to the remote. In an argument like this one today, I'm going to prefer the middle distance, a description of alternatives that is neither very close to what exists nor very far away, because the middle distance is usually the most suitable to, to conceptual clarity. But in 
practical politics and in the discourse of transformation, we have reason to dismiss proposals at the middle distance because they're likely to seem too close to what exists to arouse enthusiasm, but not close enough to be feasible. And that's why in the discourse of transformative practice, we tend to prefer the combination of the practical with the prophetic rather than the middle distance. Now, my second point of departure is to suggest a way of thinking about the distinction between the progressives and the conservatives, the left and the right. The inherited way of thinking about this contrast is to imagine that the leftists are those who prioritize equality against the background of the established political and economic institutions. And the rightists are those who prioritize freedom against the same background. So it would be shallow equality against shallow freedom when shallowness implies the acceptance of the inherited institutional context. Now, I want to suggest another way of thinking about the distinction between the right and the left, which is actually much closer to the view that prevailed before the 20th century, in the 19th century, the view shared, for example, by John Stuart Mill and by Karl Marx. There are two fundamental distinctions between the progressives and the conservatives. The conservatives are the ones who believe that it is natural for human life to be small. And only a small elite of innovators, of entrepreneurs, of saints, of heroes, of geniuses are liberated from this imposition of belittlement. The multitude is only lifted up when there is some kind of great emergency like war that then requires sacrificial devotion. The progressives are those who believe that belittlement is unnatural. But the way in which we become greater is that we become greater together, not by some stark contrast between the elite of creators and the herd of conformists. So that all has to do with the conception of the goal. But what about the method or the practice? The conservatives are the ones who think that whatever our political and economic aims, we must pursue them within the horizon of the framework of established institutions. And the progressives are the ones who think that we must go beyond this horizon beyond the limits of the established institutional framework. The question is, how are we to understand this activity of structural change? The Marxist view was that the structure, the system, the regime, what Marx called the mode of production, like the one that he described as capitalism, is an indivisible system. Either we manage that system or we replace it by another system, which he calls socialism. And so that leads then to a binary view of politics. Politics is either reformist or revolutionary, but that's not the nature of structural change. Structural change, when it happens, is almost always fragmentary. If it nevertheless persists in a certain direction, it can have an even revolutionary outcome. Now, the third point of departure is quite literally the point of departure because it has to do with where we start today. The default position of the progressives all over the world is what you could call institutionally conservative social democracy. The last great moment of institutional and ideological refoundation in the West was the social democratic settlement that was presaged before the Second World War and developed after the Second World War. The essence of that settlement 
is that the forces that threaten to reshape the worlds of power and production retreated from that threat. And in return, the state was allowed to acquire the power to regulate the economy more intensively, to attenuate inequalities generated in the market order by recourse to progressive taxation and to redistributive social spending, and to manage the economy counter-cyclically through fiscal and monetary policy. So the established institutional arrangements were accepted and then they were humanized through this activity of amelioration. And that has been ever since the default position of the progressives. Social democracy has been hollowed out of some of its concessions to the insiders, the relatively secure workers in the stable part of the labor market, for example, and retreated to the last line of defense in continental Europe, which is the maintenance of a high level of social entitlements, paradoxically financed by the regressive and indirect taxation of consumption. Today in the United States, many of the American progressives seem to think that the best that the United States could hope to do would, to be, would be to become the Sweden of 1970. Uh, their vision of what orthodox social democracy used to be like before it was hollowed out from within and forced back to this last line of defense. Uh, now that's then is the default position from which we begin. And my contention is that none of the fundamental problems of the contemporary societies can be solved or even addressed within the limits of this social democratic settlement. First, for example, the hierarchical segmentation of the production system, the division between advanced and backward sectors of production resulting in massive inequality as well as in economic stagnation. Second, the fragility of social cohesion in these societies, the basis of social cohesion under institutionally conservative social democracy are money transfers organized by the state against the background of a high level of social and cultural homogeneity. When this level of homogeneity diminishes, for example, because of migratory flows, the inadequacy of money as a social cement, as a basis of social cohesion, becomes manifest. And the third and perhaps most fundamental problem has to do with change. Under institutionally conservative social democracy and the way in which it organizes democratic politics, change depends on crisis. Crisis in the form of economic collapse or war. No trauma, no transformation. So we must reimagine this institutional framework in order to be able to address the real problems of these societies. But we cannot imagine it within the mythical binary view of politics that I mentioned before, in which any kind of structural change would have to be the replacement of one indivisible system by another. Then the idea of revolution becomes an alibi for its opposite. Many of the people who govern countries in the world today are disenchanted ex-Marxists, and they think real change would be the substitution of, quote, capitalism by socialism, relatively empty categories. And because that's not possible, or if it were possible, we, we, it would be too dangerous, what's left to do is then to manage and humanize the world that we have. And that then becomes the characteristic limit of the existing progressive imagination. Now I'm going to go on to explore the contours of an alternative uh, in four main domains. 
democratizing the market order, reinventing the market order, deepening democracy, organizing civil society outside the state and outside the market, and reshaping the character of education. With respect to the democratization of the market order, the fundamental premise is that a market order has no natural and necessary form. A market can be radically reinvented. And it is much more important to reshape its legal and institutional architecture than it is to attenuate the inequalities that it generates through retrospective and compensatory tax and transfer, or to regulate. More important to reorganize than to regulate or than to humanize. Now, in the formation of a progressive political economy today, there are three major themes. The first theme is the relation between the advanced and the backward parts of production, the vanguards and the rear guards. In every historical circumstance, there is a most advanced practice of production. Karl Marx and Adam Smith understood that the best way to explore the economy and to understand its possibilities of transformation is to study the most advanced practice of production in the historical epoch. Because the most advanced practice of production is the one that most fully reveals our powers. Now today there is a most advanced practice of production which we call the knowledge economy. The form of production that is dense in knowledge and technology and devoted to permanent productive experimentalism. This new vanguard has replaced the earlier vanguard of conventional industry, so-called Fordist mass production. Now, the new vanguard is not simply advanced manufacturer. It's multi-sectoral. It appears in every sector of the economy, in intellectually dense services and in precision or scientific agriculture, as well as in advanced manufacturer. But in each sector, it appears as a socially exclusive fringe that excludes the vast majority of workers and of firms. And this insular character of the new vanguardism has two decisive consequences. The first consequence is economic stagnation, the deacceleration of growth and productivity. If we deny the most advanced practice to the majority of the labor force and even to the vast majority of firms, how can we not expect there to be a deacceleration of economic growth? And the second consequence is an aggravation of economic inequality. The economic inequality is anchored in this structural division between the advanced and the backward parts of production. Compensatory redistribution through progressive taxation and redistributive social spending is powerless to annul the consequences of this structural inequality. The compensatory redistribution would have to be massive. And long before it reached the requisite dimension, it would begin to subvert the incentives and arrangements of the production system. How then can we imagine, and this is the first great economic project of a progressive political economy, the formation of a knowledge economy for the many, an inclusive rather than an insular knowledge economy. It depends on many conditions, educational and cultural, but also institutional. And I wanna say a word now just about the institutional conditions. Imagine that it proceeds through uh, three stages, uh, beginning from the proximate to the remote to the future. In the first stage, the object is to increase access to advanced practice and technology in favor of a much wider range of workers and of firms. 
And with respect to individuals who are detached from business organizations, individual economic agents, to come to their rescue, to lift them up, and to transform them into technologically equipped artisans, to discover empirically, experimentally what works, and to propagate it. In the second stage, we can imagine the beginning of a new legal architecture, which in the relation between the government and the firms, including local government, a decentralized strategic partnership, decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental. Not a single industrial and trade policy imposed top-down by the bureaucratic apparatus of the state, but a series of productive experiments. And in the relations among the economic agents, both firms and individuals, small and medium-sized firms and individual economic agents, what we could call cooperative competition. They would be independent proprietors and entrepreneurs, but they would also cooperate to achieve economies of scale. Now, this is not a fantasy. We have a historical example of this because it was some such combination of cooperative competition and decentralized strategic collaboration between private and public, which produced in the first half of the 19th century the family scale agriculture with entrepreneurial attributes that was one of the bases for the, for the rise of the United States. And the third stage is a stage in which we begin more fundamentally to reshape the legal and institutional architecture of the market and to develop alternative regimes of contract and property, social as well as private and property, coexisting experimentally in the same economy. Fragmentary derivative or temporary property rights and relational contracts rather than just the conventional arm's length bargain among the separate parties for some instantaneous performance in the future. The second major project of a progressive political economy has to do with the relation between finance and the real economy. Under the current arrangements, finance largely serves itself and it uses the transactions of the real economy more as a pretext than as an object. The responsibility of finance is to serve the productive agenda of society. And the best way to make finance less dangerous is to make it more useful. Now, under the current arrangements governing the relation of finance to the real economy, three enigmas arise. The first enigma is that under these arrangements, finance seems to be largely useless to the real economy. The vast majority of the funding of productive activity is generated within the production system itself on the basis of the retained and reinvested earnings of private firms. What then is the point of all of that cash, of all of that liquid capital in the banks and the stock markets. The second enigma is the asymmetry in the relation between finance and the real economy. In good times, finance is relatively indifferent to the real economy. In bad times, it becomes destructive. Financial volatility spills over the limits of finance and undermines real economic activity. And the third enigma is this. The most important responsibility of finance would be to help fund the creation of new assets in new ways, what we call venture capital or its analogous forms. But this most important responsibility actually occupies only a minuscule part of actual financial activity. Even in those economies like the United States or Israel, where venture capital is most established, what then is the short-term solution and what is the long-term direction? The short-term solution 
is to develop a series of negative and positive initiatives designed to promote financial deepening, to bring finance and the real economy closer together, as opposed to financial hypertrophy, when finance becomes bloated but fails to be enlisted in the service of production. Prohibiting, for example, those kinds of financial engineering that make no plausible contribution to the expansion of output or the ascent of productivity. And now positive initiatives, tapping the dormant productive potential a part of the liquid capital, for example, assembled in the public and private pension systems of the world, putting them into diversified portfolios of risk investment. The long-term direction, now skipping over from the short term to the very long term, going over the intermediate steps, is to imagine the following situation, the thought experiment which shows how a market economy can be organized in radically different ways. Imagine that all the major productive assets of society, technological and liquid capital, are vested in independent trusts or funds. The government doesn't dis allocate through discretionary allocation the use of those capitals. There is a rotating capital auction. And any group of Entrepreneurs and technicians, workers can bid for the use of these productive assets, paying the trust fund a rate of return for the use of those assets. And then that rate of return, the interest rate charged for the use of the, of the productive capital of society became, becomes the most important source of public finance rather than taxation. And the role of the democratic institutions is then to revise this rotating capital fund and its architecture in the light of, exper of, of, of experience. One could say, this is a kind of capitalism in which there are no capitalists, because we're imagining that no one acquires permanent claims on the major productive assets of society on its capital. The claims are always fragmentary, temporary, and relative. The third main theme of a progressive political economy has to do with the relation between labor and capital. Uh, there are two main discourses about labor now in the world. There's the neoliberal discourse, which under the euphemism of flexibility, uh, condemns a large part of the labor force worldwide to radical economic insecurity. And then there's the traditional discourse of the organized minority of the labor force, which through the apparatus of traditional labor rights and collective bargaining serves the interests of this organized minority rather than the interests of the organized, of the disorganized majority. So we have an emergency problem. The emergency problem is to prevent the, the new relations of production created in the age of the knowledge economy from resulting in radical economic insecurity. I'll give you an, a simple example to say that we have to have a new set of labor laws which allows for the creation of temporary work relations but insists on the principle of price neutrality that labor performed under conditions of unstable or temporary employment must be remunerated at a level at least comparable to the remuneration of stable labor rendered under the same conditions. In other words, flexibility cannot be allowed to become a pretext for radical insecurity and for the cheapening of labor. In the intermediate stage of this evolution, the question becomes the relation between technology and labor. It is the responsibility of the government to shape the evolution of technology. It has no intrinsic logic of evolution in such a way that it doesn't simply replace labor, it also enhances labor. What is the idea of a machine? 
Anything that we have learned how to repeat, we can express in a formula or an algorithm, and then we embody the algorithm or the formula in the physical device, the machine. The purpose of the machine is to do for us everything that we have learned how to repeat so that we can preserve our supreme resource, our time, for the not yet repeatable. And then this combination of the machine and the anti-machine, the human being, becomes immensely more powerful than either of them alone. Under a democratic market economy, no human being should be condemned to do work that can be done by a machine. The third focus, the third stage further into the future is then to go back to the idea of the 19th century liberals and socialists, that wage labor is a deficient and inferior and transitory form of free labor, which must give way in the course of time to the higher forms of free labor, partnership and cooperation. They were never able to show how the supremacy of the higher forms of free labor could be reconciled with the imperative of aggregation of resources at scale. That reconciliation is possible only through a new legal and institutional architecture, like the one of the rotating capital fund that I described before, that allows for the coexistence of relative or temporary claims on the productive assets of society. The whole objective of these three stages of institutional reformation is to assure that free labor becomes really free. Now, all of this is in one domain, democratizing the market order. The second domain is deepening democracy. All the democracies that exist in the world are flawed, weak democracies. They are weak democracies by the following standard. They all continue to make change depend on crisis. And as a result, they all perpetuate the rule of the living by the dead. How would we create a high energy democracy that no longer needs crisis in the form of ruin or war to make change possible? Through four sets of institutional innovations. First, innovations that raise the temperature of politics, the level of organized popular participation in political life through the ways of financing political activity, through free access to the means of mass communication, through the electoral regimes and so forth. We should not have to choose between a politics that is cold and institutional and a politics that is hot and anti or extra institutional. That is to say, we should not have to choose at the end of the day between Madison and Mussolini. We should be able to establish a form of political life that is both hot and institutional through these arrangements that raise the temperature of politics. The second principle is the rapid resolution of impasse between the political branches of government. Let's take the example of the American Constitution. There are two architectural principles in the American constitutional arrangements. There is a liberal principle of the fragmentation of power, and there is a conservative principle of the slowing down of politics through Madison's scheme of checks and balances. The Americans think mistakenly that these two principles are naturally and necessarily combined. In fact, they are combined by intention to produce the slowing down of politics. If there is an impasse between the two branches of government, the impasse should be resolved quickly through the engagement of the general electric. Through early elections that either of the two political branches could call, always for both branches, or through comprehensive programmatic plebiscites. In other words, we would repudiate the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics, but reiterate and radicalize the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power. 
And the third set of innovations then is to combine a facility for decisive central action with the possibility of radical devolution of power to parts of a country. Parts of a country should be able to secede from the dominant solutions and to develop counter models of the national future. So long as this power of secession is not used to entrench the prerogatives of a particular class or race or to oppress any group. So we have to be vetted both judicially and politically. And finally, the institutions of representative democracy should take on some of the attributes of direct participatory democracy. In all these ways, by the combined effect of these arrangements, we would we would create a high energy democracy that over that overthrows the the rule of the living by the dead. The third major domain of institutional transformation has to do with the organization of civil society outside the state. A disorganized society cannot generate alternatives or act on them. The real basis of social cohesion, the disposition to cooperate, must come from the ability to draw different people together into cooperative, purpose-driven action. The multiplication of forms of collective action is an enormous source of liberation, of, of empowerment. And it can be reinforced, the disposition and the willingness and the ability to cooperate by the cooperative character of education, by the participation of civil society in partnership with the state in the experimental and competitive provision of public services, not for profit. So it's not the privatization of public services, it's the engagement of civil society in the reproduction, in the creation of people, in the building of people. And most importantly, in the establishment of a principle that every able-bodied adult in a contemporary society should have at least two positions in society. A position in the system of production and skilling and a responsibility to help take care of other people beyond the boundaries of one's own family, either in some form of social service, mandatory social service as a substitute for military service early on in everyone's life, or as part of the working year responsibility to participate in, in, in the care of those who aren't able to care for themselves. Real social solidarity cannot be based on money. It can be based only on direct engagement with other people. The fourth domain is education. A progressive alternative can't have to do simply with institutions. It has to do also with consciousness. Under democracy, the school is the voice of the future. Recognizing in every young person a tongue-tied prophet. Uh, it can't be simply the instrument of uh, the family or of the state. Now, the institutional and economic background in countries like the United States or Brazil that are very large, very unequal and federal in structure must combine the local management of the schools by the states and municipalities with national standards of investment and quality. To combine them, you need three instruments, a system of assessment of performance of each student in each school, a mechanism to redistribute resources and staff from richer places to poorer places, and above all, a device to unite the Federation vertically and horizontally in coming to the assistance of local failing school systems, taking them over when necessary, fixing them, assigning them to independent fixers, and returning them fixed. But the most important thing is the paradigm, the pedagogic paradigm, the method of teaching and learning, which a democratized market order and a high energy democracy require. First, the subject of teaching and learning should always be 
transformation, the way in which you understand a social or natural phenomenon is to understand what it can become in the domain of the adjacent possible, what it can turn into. Second, the object of education must then be the acquisition of the analytical and synthetic capabilities required by this insight into transformation. Third, these capabilities cannot be acquired in a vacuum of content. They can be acquired only dealing with content. But what matters with respect to content is not encyclopedic superficiality, but selective depth, and thus the importance of themes or projects around which education should be organized. Fourth, every education should have, should aspire to provide double vision. So everyone should have access to a culture, to a society distant from their own, to study a different form of sensibility remote from now and today and here. This was the principle of classical education. Classical education in the West or in China, you would study some, some classical canon. Now we would have to have this idea, but liberated from the narrowness of the canon. That is, combining it with a pluralistic idea, the double vision achieved in many different ways. Fifth, the social basis of education, the social setting, should be cooperation. Cooperation among students, between teachers and students, between teachers and among schools. Cooperation replacing what we have today, which is the juxtaposition of individualism and authoritarianism. And most importantly, sixth, education should always be dialectical. No subject should be taught only once, and given this abandonment of encyclopedic superficiality, we would have time. Every subject should be taught at least twice from opposing points of view. This is the way in which we would form young people who were immunized against the servility of the university culture and delivered to the higher stages of education, able to resist, to imagine, to increase their insight into the actual by broadening their imagination of the possible. Now, there you have the exploration of a, a, a view of a progressive alternative beyond the dictatorship of no alternatives. I want to say now a word about the relation of this to its constituency. Every progressive project has to create its own base over time. Uh, and there are two themes that I want to emphasize. So the first theme is that there is always a duality of ways of understanding and defining a group interest. There are always some ways that are socially exclusive and institutionally conservative, and others that are institutionally transformative and socially solidaristic. For example, the workers working in declining mass production industry. Is it in their interest to build themselves into their niche in the present system of production? It has no future. Conventional industry won't come back. It has to be converted into something else, the transformative. But in this process of converting it into something else, the groups that used to be defined as enemies, the small business class, the temporary workers, the foreign workers have to become allies, thus the solidaristic tilt. And there is one particular class which is of enormous importance to the future of the progressives, and that is the small business class. If we define the petty bourgeois small business idea just objectively, it's of course a minority of the population. But if we define it subjectively to mean the aspiration to modest prosperity and independence, it is the vast majority of humanity. The most fateful mistake of the left in the 20th century was to demonize the petty bourgeoisie which then became the basis of the extreme right-wing movements of the Nazi and fascist regimes. We have to come to the side of, these, of this aspiration 
to prosperity, to independence, to initiative, and reinterpretive, to free it from its dependence on the retrograde and archaic form of isolated family business, on its commitment just to material prosperity, uh, and to family selfishness through this combination of initiatives that I earlier described. Now, the second great error of the left was with respect to the national difference. All the nations in the world, they used to be tribes, like family of families, and now they're becoming something else. Their concrete identities, their customs are being eviscerated, given up in order to prosper in this worldwide economic, military, and spiritual emulation, they must tear out part of themselves and combine some of their customs with customs which they import from other societies. The collective identities are eviscerated. And now an accident happens in the evolution of the national difference. As actual difference wanes, the desire for difference is inflamed and becomes even stronger. Two nations live side by side and they come to hate each other, not because they're different, but because they're becoming alike and because they want to be different. Reactionary nationalism proposes that we return to the inherited difference. Liberal cosmopolitanism proposes that we suppress the differences and allow these differences to exist just as a kind of cultural folklore over institutional convergence. But the best solution is not to suppress the differences, to annul them, to return to the earlier difference. The best solution is to equip the capacity to create new difference. An orthodoxy like institutionally conservative social democracy uh, cannot be effectively combated. A universal orthodoxy cannot be effectively combated just by local heresies, only by a universalizing heresy, as liberalism and socialism were in the 19th century. And what I am therefore proposing is not that we have one way for the United States, another for Brazil, another for Russia, but that we have this, the Russian, Brazilian, American versions of the same alternative, the, the, the universalizing heresies, and uh, that we equip the desire for difference. The differences that we create count for much more than the differences that we inherit, Prophecy matters more than memory. Now, if I think back over this argument that I've just made, uh, I want to say that it is uh, an incident in the history of world revolution. For the last three centuries, the whole world has been aroused by a revolutionary project for 300 years. This revolutionary project has two sides. One side is political, carried by the doctrines of democracy, of liberalism and socialism. And the other side is romantic. The, not just the high romanticism of the 19th and 20th centuries, but the worldwide popular romantic culture that through music and film and television has carried throughout the world the sublime message that the ordinary man and woman is not so ordinary after all, that he or she can, 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 can rise up and become more human by becoming more godlike, by affirming transcendence. This is the most powerful project in the world. Uh, it has many enemies. It is not the only project. But all the other projects respond to it. And it is now in the paradoxical situation of being both strong and weak. It is strong because it continues to command the agenda of humanity. But it is weak because its votaries no longer know what its next steps should be.
Uh, we then are living in what I hope will turn out to be a counter-revolutionary interlude in this long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. We should all be sobered by Voltaire's warning that those who lack the spirit of their time will nevertheless have all of its defects. Uh, but I, for one, am determined that the influences of the counter-revolutionary interlude will not shape my thoughts and my deeds. I understand that for this revolutionary project to live, it has to change in both form and substance, in method and in program. Uh, it is subject to the law of the spirit, which is that we can keep only what we reinvent. The point of the reinvention is to give ordinary men and women a better chance to stand up and to turn the tables against fate and to live in such a way that they die only once. Adrian. Thank you so much, Roberto. That was incredibly rousing. Now it's going to be time for Q&A. In this format, to pose your question, as uh, some have already done so, just simply type into the comments field uh, below the window. I will then pose your questions to Professor Unger in groups of three. So we already have comments and questions, which I really appreciate. Roberto, the first question is, it's, it's a long one, so um, be ready. So first, Alison Geyer writes, in 2005, you wrote a fascinating book called What, the Left, what Should the Left Propose? And there, as you noted at the top, uh, we need to emancipate the world from the dictatorship of no alternatives. Alison is interested in how has your ch thinking changed between then and now? And she continues to say, for example, what is your analysis of the successes and weaknesses of the Morales government in Bolivia, for example, and the tra tradition from Chavez to Maduro in Venezuela? Um, and then she, she finally says, has observing these processes and the recent left populist projects in the global north changed your thinking about how to reconstruct the program of the left? Indugu, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, Kamau writes, how does the advent of an insular knowledge economy cause the slowdown of economic growth? And the third question from Owen Hanmer is, thank you, Roberto. Can you elaborate on how your work relates to John Dewey's? Secondly, some of this rejection of blueprints, for example, reminds me of anarchist insight. Has this tradition influenced you at all? Well, there are questions of many different natures there. So um, uh, let me first speak to, to, to a relatively easy question about the relation of the insular knowledge economy to economic deacceleration, to slow down. It's pretty obvious, I think. Um, if we deny the most inventive, the most mindful practice, the, the one with the greatest fecundity, uh, the, the, the practice of the knowledge economy, to the majority of workers and to the majority of firms, how could we not expect there to be a slowdown? You know, in the United States, there's now a discourse that goes under the label secular stagnation that comes from, uh, uh, from the 1930s. Uh, saying the contemporary technologies are somehow 
less fertile or have less potential than the technological innovations of a hundred years ago. That makes no sense to me. How could something in principle have more revolutionary potential than artificial intelligence? It's because we've shaped this world in which the potential of the knowledge economy is, is not realized because we've confined it, we've quarantined it uh, in these, uh, uh, and left it as the prerogative of a, of, a, of a small number of entrepreneurs. The, the firms that, command, that, that are on the commanding heights of the knowledge economy have discovered a way to bifurcate the process of production, to define it into the creative and lucrative core, and then into a routinized part. The routinized part is what they then delegate to firms and workers in other parts of the world. And that the, 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 the insular knowledge economy is then accompanied by the consignment of a large part of the world labor force to a new putting out system on a global scale. You know, the putting out system described by Karl Marx in the early chapters of Das Kapital, the worker gives the material and the machines to workers who work at home. That's what we now have in the world on a world scale. Uh, because of this, this perverse insular knowledge economy, which has denied us the potential of this new form of production. Now, Adrian, can you remind me of some of the other questions, please? Absolutely. Um, Alison Geyer had asked a, a question about uh, a book that you published in 2005. Yes, which yes. Pose, yes. And how has your thinking changed since in those intervening years? Well, uh, I think that the, the, the dramatic character of this picture that I attempted to draw has become clearer, right? So what are the alternatives in the world? Outside of the rich North Atlantic countries, we have um, basically authoritarian state capitalism. Uh, uh, there's no program that it seems worthy of being imitated. But nevertheless, there's this enormous micro-experimentalism, this Brownian motion coming from below, which we should be able to tap into. And the world is sensationally connected so that any path tried out in a part of the world with some semblance of success that could be interpreted as a down payment, as an installment of some other direction, could have a sensational effect in the world. This always has to be the method of the prophet. We have to touch the wound to believe. We have to see the tangible anticipation of the alternative. But when the doctrine is combined with this tangible alternative, it has tremendous power to instruct and inspire. In the meantime, the main thing that has become manifest in the intervening years is that the failure of institutionally conservative social democracy and its liberalized form, social liberalism, uh, has then resulted in uh, a vacuum, a political vacuum, and into this political vacuum comes right-wing or plutocratic populism, which has no institutional legacy. What, what is its program? Its, its, its economic program is the same as the conventional program of the, of, of the progressives who, who want the United States to become the Sweden of 1970. Uh, and uh, uh, they want to restrict migration and increase executive power, but that's it. They have no institutional program. In politics, uh, the only thing that matters are the institutions. Reallocation of resources from here to there, like the waves of the sea that come and go. The only thing that remains is the institutional legacy. That's that's what we that's what we should 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 fight for. And in politics, it's also the case 
that the force that commands the agenda of the future is the force that most credibly embodies the cause of creative energy, of construction, not just the humanization of the project of the other people, which is what the progressives now do, kind of the sugarcoating. Of, of an institutional form that they are unable to re reimagine and remake. Thank you, Roberto. How about um, Owen's question? Would you say that your um, line of thought and inquiry has uh, any relation to uh, John Dewey's arguments? Um, well, it's very interesting because I think there is a... Uh, there's a relation to American pragmatism, of course, in many of my ideas, but the, but the pragmatist principle was never radicalized into experimentalism about the frameworks, either the frameworks of society or the frameworks of thought. Uh, you know, um, uh, one of the, in, so we could, say a word about the United States, even though it's not directly opposite to this. So uh, how was the United States built in the first half of the 19th century? It was built through the combination of a Hamiltonian project of building the country, opening the agrarian frontier, uh, a, a mobilization of national resources from on top, all the presidents of the United States down through Abraham Lincoln regarded themselves as Hamilton's disciples. But that was then combined against the ter terrible background of African slavery with the selective democratization of the economy in two spheres. One, which were the most important parts of the American economy then in the first half of the 19th century, agriculture and finance. In agriculture, they created something that seemed impossible, family scale agriculture with entrepreneurial characteristics. The Marxists had said it was impossible. The conservatives in England had said it impossible. The Americans did that. It was, an ex it was, it was a, a presage to part of the economic program that I described in my, in my talk. And in finance, they disbanded the national bank and they created the most decentralized system of credit at the service of the local producer that had ever existed in the world. When they did this in agriculture and finance, they were not regulating the market uh, or uh, attenuating inequalities through retrospective tax and transfer. They were inventing in agriculture and in finance a kind of market that had never existed before. But to do that systematically, to do that in spades, to do that in every sector of the economy, they would have to have the idea of its possibility. And that then leads me then to the subject of consciousness. Uh, the immense influence in the United States of the message of the American prophets, of Emerson, of Whitman, of Lincoln, the Saturnine form in Melville, and the message of the American prophets was that the individual participates in the divine attribute of transcendence. The characteristic contribution of the American people to the religious uh, history of humanity was this religion that uh, Harold Bloom calls the American religion. The individual is not just godlike, the individual is God in a sense, in the Church of Latter-day Saints, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, but this American, this American prophecy was tainted from the outset in two ways. One way is through a disturbance in the understanding of the relation between self-construction and solidarity. So the Americans, as described by Tocqueville, we're not passionate about equality, as Tocqueville described. Their real passion was a certain idea of freedom. The individual is a little Napoleon who crowns himself. Uh, and they misunderstood that solidarity doesn't come after self-construction. Solidarity is internally related to self-construction. 
Uh, and the second taint was the taint of institutional idolatry. The idea that the United States discovered at the time of its foundation, the definitive form of a free society. The other nations of the world must either subscribe to this formula or continue to languish in poverty and despotism. This is a heresy for, for a Christian would say, it's a Christian heresy. Uh, the institutions are dust in the face of God. They, they have to be respected so that we can revere the individual. And so what I would say about John Dewey, about the American pragmatists, and more generally about the form of consciousness that has prevailed in the United States, is that they never went far enough in attacking this double taint on the prophetic message. Thank you so much, Roberto. Uh, we have a question from Pat Kane the idea of planetary limits and ecological exigency fit within your alternative, Roberto? I was wondering a similar question, followed by uh, Roman Ryan has asked, what organizations do you believe might implement these economic political principles and practices that you're describing? And will profits be necessary or antithetical? And finally, from Joel, is there any space of action, for example, ur urban areas, you think of as more promising than others? If so, how do you think of their coordination within the nation, within nations and across them? In, in cities, is that? It, in, it, like spaces for action or of action. It could uh -huh. be cities, it could be rural areas. What do you think is more promising? Well, I think, of course, this would, this would require a much more detailed discussion than is possible now. But, but the, the, the general principle which I've attempted to, to affirm, to defend, is that The multiplication of collective action, of, of ways in which people can do things together, especially across the, the boundaries of difference, is the most important form of social cohesion and has the greatest potential for fecundity. So mobilization across difference now uh, is... A, a, and the highest form of cooperation is the form that is most hospitable to innovation. Every innovation threatens the established cooperative regime because the question is who will benefit, who will lose. And the best form of innovation is the one that is most tolerant of radical innovation. And... Uh, Doing things together in many different ways, and especially on the basis of difference, is the most important source of, of, of cohesion. Now, Adrian, the other, the, the initial, so on planetary limits, uh, uh, it would be the first time in the history of humanity that any technical problem has defeated us. Uh, so I have to say that I, I'm really very skeptical of this idea that there's any limit, there, there's any problem of food or energy that we can't figure out. Uh, we always have. Uh, uh, there is unlimited energy in, in principle if we have the right science for it. Our problems are not these technical problems about means and ends, the administration of a fixed stock of resources. Uh, our problems all have to do with our relations to one another. That's what I believe. But it would require a long, a very long discussion to defend that uh, in detail. Thank you. Um, as to Roman's question, what organizations do you believe might implement these economic or political principles or practices? And well, will I think, I, think I, I tried to imply the nature of these organizations. For example, when I spoke about these trusts, so I imagine what I described at a certain point in the talk as 
capitalism without capitalists. I imagine that the productive assets of society don't belong to anyone. They're put in these independent trusts. They have trustees. They manage the productive assets of society, long-term, short-term, high-risk, low-risk. We try things out experimentally. Instead of having the market order fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself, we organize an experiment in the market economy. We have alternative property regimes. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, take, take the abstract idea of the market. Even at the most abstract level, the idea of a market has two dimensions. The absolute level of economic decentralization with the number of economic agents who can bargain on their own initiative and for their own account. And then the absoluteness of the control that each of those agents has over the resources at their command, which is the unified absolute form of property. Now, the conventional idea is that these two dimensions go together, but they don't go together. In fact, they contradict each other because it might be possible to expand the degree of absolute economic decentralization, that is, access, decentralized access to productive resources and opportunities by limiting the absoluteness of the control. This, this, that is by saying, you can have these resources, but you have them for a while, so long as you can provide the highest rate of return for their use. You don't have them permanently. You can't bequeath them to the hereditary transmission of property. You can rent them. Uh, and so all property is fragmentary or temporary or conditional. So then we imagine in such an order, the creation of many forms of organization that are not state organization, they're not political, they're not the discretionary allocation of resources by a central government, but they're not, but they're also not the tyranny of the individual property owner. So there should always be in the market order a space for the traditional property right. Unified, assembling all the component powers of property together, investing them in one right holder, the owner. Because the advantage of the traditional unified property is it allows someone, the entrepreneur, to do something at his own risk that no one else believes in. And we should want there to be that possibility, but we shouldn't want that to be the only legal form for the radical decentralization of economic resources. Thank you for that. Uh, my question, Roberto, is um, maybe a very simplistic one, but uh, where to begin, essentially. You've articulated three projects I, uh, I heard, which was that uh, we need to drastically rethink um, and reshape, reform the market. Democratize to... the market order, deepen democracy, organize civil society outside the state in the market, and change the character of education. Four projects. Okay, so which, if we only have the 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 capacity to mobilize to address one or two at the moment. So I don't think that's how it is, Adrian. So, so I think the question of where you begin yes. is always opportunistic and circumstantial. So you begin where, where you can. So it's not going to be the same thing in Brazil as it is in the United States or in Russia or anything. It's just circumstance. But it's circumstance subject to a principle of combined and uneven development. So you begin on one front because it's the front that is most available to you. It's the one that has the greatest possibility in your country at a particular time. And then you proceed along that front until you hit against a certain limit. And then in order to go further, you have to change something else. So then, so, so it's, it's, the, the different parts of the social reality constrain each other, it's true, but they're not a system. It's a structure, it's not a system. It's not an indivisible system. And so what, what it means is that you can deconstruct part of it up to a point 
as far as you can go, and then you come against a limit. The door is locked, and then you have to go and fiddle with something else. That's the real. That's the real nature of transformation. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. We have one more question from Lynn Jones. Uh, how do the trustees get chosen or elected? What guides or constrains them? Oh, that's, that's just a, I mean, that's that's a detail, right? I mean, you could say it's it, I, I was imagining that was just a thought experiment. I was I was imagining that they could be selected by some on the basis of professional competence. There'd be some profession of the managers of these funds. After all, it's not that different from the management of investment funds today and that they would have to prove themselves competitively and professionally. Uh, and there'd be some process. I, it could be like the process for choosing investment managers in the private economy. It could be like the process for choosing professors in the academy, we have to figure that out. And we wouldn't have a single dogmatic form. We'd have, we'd, we'd experiment. And this is a very important general point about my whole argument. So <clears throat> like the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we have reason to affirm the primacy of structural alternatives over non-structural ones. Huh? But unlike the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we also have reason not to entrust our future to dogmatic institutional blueprints. So we have a problem without historical precedent, which is how to affirm the primacy of structural change without succumbing to a structural dogmatism. Thank you very much. Incredibly powerful. We're at 1.26 p.m. So if there is any other questions, we can entertain them now. Otherwise, uh, Roberto, you have left us uh, with a lot to mull over and certainly a lot of work to do, uh, which I am very aware of. So uh, we really appreciate your time here. We, uh, I want to thank everyone for attending today's talk. And again, of course, to Professor Roberto Mangabera Unger for joining us today. Um, it's been a pleasure. Please, if you are voting, please vote. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. Bye.